Welcome to From the Quarries. Tonight's video, Masonic Tracing Boards, was written by the wonderfully named brother E. A. T. Breed of Lodge Number 811 in Sussex. It was published in 1904. This is a very detailed examination indeed of the history, nature and types of tracing boards throughout Masonic history, and as such it covers a lot of ground. I'll be splitting it into two videos because I think the text is so dense that a long duration is too much to take in in one sitting. Throughout the work he refers to the world of a hundred years ago, so I ask all listeners to realise that this was written in 1904, so when he says last century or a hundred years ago, as he does repeatedly, today we're really talking about 200 or 230 years ago. Anyway, it's a fascinating topic and I hope you enjoy it. Good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. The subject to which I propose to direct your attention this evening is in connection with one of those common objects displayed in every lodge, and with the form and aspect of which you are all familiar. The tracing board, it is usually called, and it is referred to in the first lecture as one of the three jewels that lie open and immovable in the lodge for the brethren to moralise upon. It is, probably, in a large measure, owing to the familiarity the brethren have with this jewel, as a consequence of the prominent position it usually occupies in every regular lodge, coupled with the attention so frequently and particularly directed to it when lectures upon it are given, an impression is naturally created that both the object and subject are commonplace, unworthy of particular notice. But, Commonplace as in a sense this subject is, and simple as it appears to be, it nevertheless comprises elements of considerable interest, and is worthy of a greater amount of consideration and attention than is usually bestowed upon it by the ordinary Mason. First, let me remind you that the appellation Tracing Board, as applied to this interesting jewel, is, as you are doubtless aware, inaccurate and that it should more appropriately, as well as more accurately, be called the trestle or lodge board. I propose, however, throughout this paper, to adhere to the incorrect appellation, as being the one we are all most familiar with. Next, I would remind you that its origin, as well as its early history, like most other subjects connected with our order, as indeed of the order itself, is enveloped in a veil of secrecy, which so far has baffled all efforts to entirely raise. But though complete success has not yet attained the efforts of those who attempted the task of raising it, some progress has been made towards effecting this object, some information obtained, and some few facts brought to light not previously known. That these lodge or trestle boards are undoubtedly a connecting link between the operative masonry of ages now long past and gone, and the speculative Freemasonry of the present day, admits, I think, of little doubt, since the connection can be fairly traced. Still there are missing links which require replacing before we can claim a complete and unbroken chain. I would suggest that in considering the subject, therefore, it is necessary to do so under two heads. One, their operative use and history, and two, their speculative use and history. With the operative use and history of the tracing board, I shall deal but very briefly, since it is not material to my paper, except so far as it was probably the ancestor, so to speak, or basis on which the speculative tracing board was founded. And it is with this other aspect I propose to deal at large this evening. However, I would direct your attention and refer you to, to a particularly interesting paper from 1893 
by Brother C. Purden Clark. In this paper, Brother Clark explained the form and use of the tracing board amongst the operative workmen in Persia, with which he became acquainted when in that country some years previously. And he showed how, in that country, it had an unbroken record of usage for upwards of 4,000 years, and the plans of buildings there are designed not as our architects do now on plain paper, but on sectional lined tracing boards, every square of which represents one or four bricks, bricks in that country being square. And he adds, These tracing boards are the key to what otherwise appears a mystery, as they represent in miniature scale the floor of the master builder's workroom. He also illustrated the uses of this tracing board and a fixed scale or canon of proportions as applied both to architecture and sculpture in other countries, on both the continents of Asia and Europe. And in conclusion, he drew attention to the fact that the use of floors in proportions of buildings in course of erection by medieval masons for tracing their full-size details, is well known. And he mentioned various places where traces of these plans may be seen, viz. on the terrace roofs of the aisles of the Cathedral of Limoges at Clermont and St. Quentin. The late lamented brother G. W. Speth summed up this paper in a few concise words, which may not be considered inappropriate to quote. He said... I think there can be no two opinions as to the interesting nature of the paper we have just heard. As a society of Freemasons descended in direct lineal continuation from the societies of actual builders, the methods of these latter can never be otherwise than of interest to us, even though the methods themselves have no real and obvious bearing on our proceedings of today. In the present case, I think the connection is quite possible although there may be many gaps to fill up, the evidence for which has not yet come to hand. Brother Clark has shown us that in Egypt a tracing board of squares was used, whilst in Persia this tracing board is actually, in one of its forms, the floor of the architect's workshop itself. And he went on to refer to the pavement squares of our lodges and its corresponding likeness to this Persian tracing board and concluded by saying, The missing gap is here to show that our medieval operative lodges, this squaring of the plans, was used. But Brother Clark has shown, at least, that designs were worked out on the floors of the buildings, which is a step in that direction. If, therefore, we were justified in concluding that something similar to the Persian practice prevailed in England, then we should have an obvious operative origin for our Masonic pavement the alternate colouring of black and white in the squares, which would be unsuitable for operative purposes, might be attributed to subsequent symbolic ideas. This comment, as you will notice, raises two points. One, the descent of the tracing board from the operative medieval mason, and on the other, the origin and form of the square pavement with which our lodges are universally ornamented. I will leave the latter point as being only an incident to the subject. There is just one other short reference I wish to make whilst dealing with this side of the subject. That is, in Kenning's Cyclopedia, it is recorded that a tracing board was mentioned in an inventory of effects belonging to the ancient York Lodge of Operative Masons at York in the 14th century, thus showing that our medieval operative brethren possessed amongst other effects, a tracing board, although it may not prove its actual use or form. I do not think I need to dwell longer on this side of the subject, but will proceed with the second part, viz. their speculative use and history. And I may here at once say that as far as I have been able to ascertain down to the present, the tracing board in its present form came into use in our lodges about a hundred years ago. Whether such boards were in use before that, and if so, for how long, or to what extent, has not been ascertained. Fresh facts and information are practically daily coming to hand, 
These facts would take up too much space and time to give in detail. I have therefore thought it better on this occasion to deal in generalities rather than particularities, as the time is hardly yet ripe to deal with the latter, and some new information may any day turn up which might cause me to modify the conclusions I have formed. As an illustration, I may mention that as late as last Tuesday, I received a letter from Brother Sadler, of the, the sub-librarian of the Grand Lodge, in which he calls my attention to two entries in Lodge Minutes, one of the year 1733, in which it is recorded that Lodge No. 28, the Old King's Arms, purchased a drawing board and in 1787 a trestle board was presented. Also in the minutes of the Medina Lodge, number 35, there occurs the following entry. Brother William Gouge, this night, made a present to this lodge of a painted cloth, representing the several forms of Mason's lodges. This entry will antedate my assumed date by some years, but I would point out does not destroy my general proposition, as it is only evidence that in those two instances a tracing board was obtained in these lodges. But what about the greater number of others that did not seek to obtain a set until many years after? However, in fixing the period at which I suggest the tracing board was adopted as about a hundred years ago, I will give you the dates of a few of the earliest sets I have been able to trace in lodge use or custody, and also direct your attention to a few outside illustrations, and then leave you to draw your own conclusions. I may however mention, in regard to outside illustrations, that though I have stated my opinion as the date of the adoption or introduction of the tracing board into our lodges as having taken place about a hundred years ago, I am aware illustrations of forms of lodges or tracing boards exist, which extend back at least fifty years earlier. For instance, there is a pictorial representation in Cole's Illustrations of Masonry of 1801, also one in an English pamphlet entitled Solomon in All His Glory of 1768, and others in the French book Le Maison de Masque of 1757, and in a still earlier French engraving of a lodge interior of about 1750, all of which have a strong resemblance to the early, earliest form of a tracing board. Some may object that these illustrations or pictorial representations are not tracing boards proper, and I concur in this. But I have mentioned them as they have a very strong likeness to the early tracing board, and as illustrations of the form of the lodge. At the same time, even if they were actual tracing boards, they could hardly be admitted as evidence of either existence or use in our lodges in this country, unless supported by additional evidence of undoubted character, because they are only unauthentic exposures and of a similar character to many others of that period. Dr. Oliver, however, who is a well-known Masonic author, would appear to place some credence on the French illustration referred to, because in his History of the Royal Arch of 1867, he refers, while dealing with another subject, to an old master mason's tracing board or floor cloth published on the continent almost immediately after symbolical masonry had been received in France, as a branch from the Grand Lodge of England in 1725, which furnished the French masons with a written copy of the lectures then in use. But I shall content myself with mentioning that whilst these illustrations did exist, of their purport and actual value, I leave you to judge. This is all somewhat anticipating my subject, so in order to make myself clear, I must first explain, as briefly as I can, the custom of the lodge previous to the tracing board being adopted. It is therefore necessary for me to ask you to step back into the past, say 200 years ago, when practically there is no doubt as to what the usage and custom then was. In order that you may fully realise the usual aspect of a lodge at that period, you must dismiss from your mind 
a lodge as you know it now, furnished as it is, with the latest accessories and comforts of civilization. In those days, the lodge generally met at some reputable inn or well-known hostelry. The walls of the room were not papered as now, but panelled with oak or other wood panelling, dark and polished with age. The beams and rafters overhead were bare and exposed, not sealed over and whitened as now. The fireplaces were large, spacious, open chimney places with fires on the hearth. Electric lights, gas, or even oil lamps were unknown, candles being the illuminant in those days. Chairs and seats, comfortably upholstered and cushioned such as we are accustomed to, were not in vogue, while the floor was the bare boards, carpets and druggets being an unknown luxury. You may probably wonder how our ancient brethren managed without all those comforts, but managed they did, and fairly happy they seem to have made themselves. To proceed, however, with my description, the floor of the room in which they met being bare boards was sprinkled with sand. When, however, there was an initiation, and probably on other special occasions, a space in front of the master's pedestal or centre of the room was left or swept clear of sand, and in this clear space the tiler drew with chalk, charcoal and blue stone, or some of those substances, the ground plan of a building or other geometrical figure. In his preface to the Ahiman Raison of 1764, Brother Lawrence Dermot, who always took advantage of any occasion to have a dig at his opponents in the moderns, after referring to his veneration for such implements as are truly emblematical or useful in refining our moral notions, goes on to illustrate his stricture by saying, Nor is it uncommon for the tiler to receive ten or twelve shillings for drawing two signposts with chalk, etc., and writing Jamaica rum upon the one and Barbados rum upon the other. And all this, I suppose, for no other purpose than to distinguish where those liquors are to be placed in the lodge. This drawing is considered by some to have been a representation of the ground plan of King Solomon's temple, whilst others deem it to have represented the form of the lodge. But whatever it was, or was meant to represent, is immaterial. It was termed drawing the lodge, and if there had been an initiation, it was incumbent upon the initiate to wash this drawing out before the lodge was closed, a mop and pail being supplied for the purpose. And neither rank nor position in life exempted him from the discharge of this office. This custom of drawing the lodge prevailed from the earliest days of speculative Freemasonry down to the actual introduction of the tracing board, with probably some exceptions in its latter days, or during what may be termed its transition period, when, from some cause or other, but precisely what is not yet clear, the old custom became superseded or fell into disuse. And during this period, various expedients appear to have been resorted to. I will mention just one or two which we are told or have evidence were adopted during this period. Naturally, some diversity prevailed, but we are told that some lodges adopted the expedience of a tape and nails, whereby the drawing being outlined with tape could be nailed down to the floor of the lodge. I think, however, you will agree with me, this custom would be one which would have neither an extensive nor lengthy existence, as such an expedient would not be conducive to what could be termed fair wear and tear of the floor of the room. Another expedient resorted to was that of having the symbols we now see depicted on the board cut out in wood or metal, and these were deposited on the floor of the lodge. The Grand Lodge of England possessed several such sets, both in wood and metal. This custom seems to me to have, have some connection with the wording of the lecture as set out in Hutchison's Spirit of Masonry of 1775. He there says, as Solomon at Jerusalem carried into the Jewish temple all the vessels and instruments requisite for the service of Jehovah, according to the laws of his people, so we Masons, 
as workers in moral duties and servants of the Grand Architect of the Universe, have placed in our view those emblems which should constantly remind us of what we are and what is required of us. And I cannot refrain from making this comment, that with regard to these lectures on the tracing board as given now, whilst we have retained the shell, we have ignored the kernel. However, this is outside my subject. To return, there were other expedients adopted, but these will suffice as illustrations, although there is one other which I shall mention later on. But I wish first to say one or two words upon the reasons for the discontinuance of the old custom. Various reasons have been assigned, and amongst others the ridicule entailed on the initiate on account of the well-known duty which devolved upon him. As an illustration of this ridicule, I may remind you of Hogarth's well-known satirical picture, Night, where the master is depicted as, if not disguised in liquor, at any rate of requiring the assistance, guidance, and protection of the tiler, whilst the initiate is pointedly depicted as being armed or adorned with a mop and pail. The date of this picture is 1738. Another reason alleged by a writer about a century ago attributed the discontinuance of the old custom to the loss of the art of drawing by the tilers. This, I think, could hardly have been the case, as it is not likely the art would have died out suddenly, and insufficient tilers survive to impart the necessary instruction to their successors, if called upon, to continue the custom. And I think one may fairly assume neither of these reasons was responsible for the discontinuance of the old custom, though each may have been an element. But it was about this period that a greater amount of comfort than previously existed began to predominate in the furnishings and surroundings of houses generally, and lodge rooms no doubt participated in the change, particularly with regard to the introduction of carpets, wherewith the hitherto bare and sanded floor was covered up, and as carpets, of whatever texture they might be, would be unsuitable to draw upon with chalk, charcoal and bluestone, or any of those substances, the ground plan of a building or other design, wherever a carpet was put down, some other expedient had to be adopted of drawing the lodge. And, amongst others, in addition to those I have mentioned, we are told of one which probably played an important part in the transformation which ultimately took place. That was the depiction of the symbols and form of the lodge on a piece of cloth or linen, which could be laid on the floor when required for use, and rolled up and put away when not required. And it seems to me as not only feasible, but extremely probable, that to this, or some similar custom, the origin of the present form of tracing board is attributable. As it would prove an easy and natural development at a later date, to transfer this cloth to the plain black or original tracing board, and for the two to become subsequently combined. It may be a question whether the tracing board and floor cloth are not separate subjects, but if in one sense they are, in another they are intimately connected, and it is almost impossible to disconnect them, so as to discuss the one without some reference to the other as also in other terms which appear to have been used in order to express the same or a similar meaning. However, before I say more on this point, I will proceed to give another reason for fixing the date of the adoption of tracing boards in their present form to about a century ago. The Grand Lodge of England possesses an interesting document in the shape of an account of the expenses incurred on the occasion of the initiation of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, afterwards George IV, in 1787. The two first items which appear to me as being most significant, one is to postage of a large board, and the other is paid tiler for drawing the lodge, and to my mind suggest the following meaning. The large board was an ordinary black or trestle board, such as is now used for illustrating lectures, etc., while the item, paid tiler for drawing the lodge, indicates 
that the ancient custom was still in vogue, and resorted to on this occasion, thus proving that the art of drawing was known and practised at that date, and that the old custom of drawing the lodge still prevailed at any rate in that lodge. Had any other custom been adopted, it would, in all probability, have been in some way recorded, especially on so important and unique an occasion, and there would have been no necessity for the item for drawing the lodge. Grand Lodge also possesses a set of tracing boards similar to those now in use, dated 1810, which belonged to a lodge number 262, now and for many years extinct, attached to the 7th Regiment of Light Dragoons, afterwards the 7th Hussars. This renowned regiment played a conspicuous and distinguished part in the Battle of Waterloo. The lodge became extinct shortly after the return of the regiment in 1824, when it sent its tracing boards and other articles to the Grand Lodge. Another set, dated one year later, 1811, belongs to and is still in use in the Union Lodge No. 36, Chichester. It belonged originally to a Lodge No. 624, warranted in 1811 at Chichester, of which the 4th Duke of Richmond was the first master, and which, in 1828, united with No. 52, both surrendering their warrants and receiving a new one as Union Lodge. The minute book records in September of that year the trestle boards with emblems painted thereupon be obtained from London, and the boards were painted, dated, and signed by the artist brother J. Bowring of London, and are still in use in the lodge. We have here two genuine tracing boards over 100 years old, on the one hand, we have the record of the initiation of the Prince of Wales 116 years ago, and I accordingly think that it was between these dates that the tracing board was adopted, although its use was not general until some years later.